rápidamente, eh, bueno, en español, muchas gracias a todos. La idea es, este, como Freddy lo está planteando, que este sea un espacio de intercambio para poder crecer y aprender sobre temas eh, en general de investigación, eh, de cómo es que se traduce la transdisciplinariedad, diría yo. How is uh, transdisciplinary work uh, being uh, needed in this space? It would be like my first uh, side question. Um, yo, um, and I will also just, uh, I want to take a, a, just a, a few seconds to thank two, two people that are, aren't in the meeting, but uh, they might be seeing this later. And, Uh, so there are two people who have uh, supported me in all of this process and uh, um, one is uh, Dr. Herrera who has been uh, uh, writing with me a lot of papers and, and dealing with a lot of stuff uh, related with uh, my ideas of, of uh, statistics and things like that. And so I really am thankful uh, to this person, to this Dr. Herrera because of, of his work. And then the second person is the doctora, that for me is the doctora Sandra Silva, who, um, well, her, her work also has opened me um, a door and all of this project of Mandarina Labs for me, it's uh, also a portrait of, uh, or, um, a door basically to be able to support all the researchers in uh, making their own projects come to a life and be able to actually extend how uh, we need together, uh, we actually um, grow these projects of science, these projects of, of understanding our uh, nature or our planet or whatever we want to reach. So um, um, honestly, I want to thank everybody be, for being here. I think all of this uh, is, um, it's because all of you actually, because uh, uh, all of you are making this happen and by your interactions. So uh, during the talk, I will be sharing some links. So if you haven't registered uh, at uh, one of our, Uh, databases for to keep basic to keep the information of these talks or if you want to um, give us a, a hand or supporting a blog or something or you want to actually just we can actually decide it or just um, uh, get together uh, or agree with doing something at, at this point and then Um, the idea will actually to locate funding, to apply for funding. Uh, well, there is a, a proposal from Professor Kim and Kim also to apply to IBS funding in order to uh, support our community and make it grow. So I think it will be very, very good to um, um, be able to uh, publish in different levels, like from the uh, scientific article, which is our core and our uh, more uh, developed skill, I will say, but we have to also go beyond and divulgate or uh, be able to translate science in a more articulated uh, manners or uh, integrating different views from from physics, from uh, mathematics, from um, biology, uh, from medicine, from all of, all of these uh, different perspectives. So uh, in this point, I will um, just uh, basically open the door to Professor Kyunman Kim, which um, I will just uh, tell a bit, a bit of uh, the story where I met him because Well, he was in the committee where uh, my paper for uh, the ISCB or the International uh, Statistics Biostatistics Conferences was was going to happen while was at, while I was doing my PhD project, and um, I sent a, a piece which actually was uh, published after uh, different after several years after I have worked with Alison Dunkley which uh, she was uh, a very, very good um, uh, 
co-worker in this in this project but then her article get published and then i did some work here in costa rica where my article got published and now uh it's it's been somewhere there uh being shared by a lot of people i think but the funny thing is that now I, I am I feel very honored of presenting Professor Kuhnman Kim because um, well he's one of the ones who have uh, supported all of this project from very 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 long time ago. He will he's very very good at memory with uh, time. He's very very <laughs> impressive with that skill. <laughs> I think he will impress all of you in a few seconds and. Uh, so I'm very grateful, uh, especially with the professor, because uh, especially for being here and uh, offering this inaugural talk for, for all of us and to basically support and believe this Latin American project, which I think uh, it, is, it is basically starting and we are, uh, I feel responsible in some in some way of, of all of uh, these uh, um, things that are getting um, more and more frequently in in the and getting more uh, frequent in the in the speech of uh, politicians and um, and other types of, of leaders at the moment and uh, so the. The other just very little things that I want to say really quick is that uh, uh, key things about the talk uh, that I think this meta colloquio in biostatistics means is also a question mark in what is uh, what it means to do or to make or to elaborate uh university spaces or uni or university itself or academy or uh science what is it to to actually build up uh this uh this whole uh concept that brings together different uh disciplines together in in order to interpret our nature uh the other uh key words are uh, in terms of which are the bias or which are the things that uh, we are maybe not foreseen in order to estimate uh, our future or our presence or um, uh, our the basically the evidence that we get in order to actually make decisions. And um, in that sense, I will just uh, make a quick a quick note in order to highlight to um the well the two objectives that i think that are related to to the medicine in order to and i want to recall this just because i think it is important to understand why we do or why we are undertake biostatistics projects for example and uh, and previously with with professor uh Kim, when we were uh talking about um different situations in life where I think that the two questions that come across are uh, how long we want to live or the, the hope, our hope in, in, in our life expectancy, but also which quality we want to bring into our lives. Or is it both or is it just uh, um, one or the other or well, it's just one of the broad questions that I would like to 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 come across of uh, to start this this forum, and I, now I want to give the the space to Professor Kuyman uh, Kim so he can tell us uh, more about his work and who who he actually is. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. So this is the uh, a PDF file, so I'll have to learn how to make it. Does that work? Full screen? All right. It does, it looks, it looks well. Okay, thanks. So the title of my presentation is the Independent Increments in Group Sequential Test, 
sort of a prepared as a review and uh, I was uh, 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 asked by the uh, Catalan Statistical Society a, to uh, sort of a, 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 a paper to uh, submit a paper that was in 2018 at the uh, uh, no, it was it 2000? Yeah, 2018 at the International Biometric Conference, and it took me a, a couple of years, and finally I submitted an article last year. So it came out uh, in the uh, uh, July December issue of the uh, uh, SORT uh, Statistics and Operations Transaction from the uh, Catalan Society of uh, Statistics. And so it's based on that, but uh, this is a, a kind of expansion of the talk by uh, 2013 and, uh, and before, just summarizing some of the methodological development that culminated in the uh, uh, wider application of a method known as a group sequential methods in monitoring clinical trials. So, I, so I'll just briefly introduce uh, sort of a type of clinical trial that I'll be talking about and briefly review the uh, historical development of the sequential methods uh, going back to the uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century and then get into the specific topic of independent increment, why that is important. And I'll review a couple of uh, uh, methodology that addresses the uh, uh, situation where independent increment does not appear to be sort of intuitive or natural to happen, uh, i.e. in terms of the longitudinal data and the uh, failure time data or time to event data. And then I'll present uh, with some examples and conclude with some discussions. So please feel free to interrupt me if you have uh, uh, questions. Uh, that can be addressed, but uh, I would like to reserve time at the end of my presentation for more in-depth discussion. So uh, NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health of the Department of Health and Human Services of the US government, finally came up with a definition for clinical trial that it involves human uh, participants and it prospectively assigns one or more interventions, uh, which may include placebo or other controls. And these studies are designed to evaluate the effect of intervention on uh, human participant in terms of the uh, health-related biomedical uh, or biobehavioral outcomes. So it, it essentially it measures uh, how uh, people leave and feel uh, uh, in terms of their uh, sort of a health sort of outcomes. And the types of clinical trial could be many different. Uh, it involves mechanistic studies. It may involve uh, pharmacological treatment or, or drugs, or it could even be screening uh, technology in terms of you know, monitoring, say, breast cancer or, or, or lung cancer to see whether early identification of the disease uh, prevents uh, death from the disease that will eventually develop. And also it will involve biobehavioral behavioral interventions such as uh, uh, diet or, or uh, behavioral intervention in terms of how to improve the uh, uh, lifestyles in terms of uh, how many hours you sort of get to be more physically active and so forth. So uh, in terms of the early sequential methods development, I would like to sort of remind uh, what Peter Armitage, who was one of the most influential person in terms of introducing sequential methods into the uh, therapeutics or preventive uh, clinical trial. Uh, in an article in 1990, he said, a scientific investigation is sequential if its conduct at any stage depends on the outcome at previous stages. So the, the, probably the first uh, appearance of this sort of uh, application is in the sampling inspection of manufactured goods in industrial experimental setting. And the objective was to uh, you know, save cost of experiments because this type of inspection involves destroying the uh, potentially uh, uh, 
uh, find sort of a, a, a items uh, being dis uh, I mean destroyed as part of the uh, uh, inspection. And that approach was developed by Dodge and Romick in 1929, published in Bell Laboratory Technical uh, uh, Reports. And in, uh, during the World War II, uh, both the United Kingdom and the United States separately developed sequential uh, approach uh, to support the war effort, including the, you know, this type of sampling inspection and others. And then uh, it was uh, Erwin Bross and Peter Armitage in uh, respective publication in 1952 and 54. They saw the, uh, uh, sort of a reason for considering uh, sequential methods in uh, clinical trials involving human subjects because ethics of uh, continuing experimentation beyond the point where you have a very clear uh, answer to a, a clinical question in terms of both risks and benefits. And so, So uh, just to sort of provide some sort of simple uh, uh, review of the early sequential method, the uh, Wall's uh, uh, sequential probability ratio test was the expansion of the uh, 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 Lehman sort of a Pearson, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the lemma, a lemma about how to test a simple hypothesis say H naught uh, uh, versus H1 and uh, making decisions uh, of D0 or D1 favoring null and alternative hypothesis respectively. And instead of doing the uh, traditional fixed sample sort of uh, investigation where you collect data for a specified number of uh, uh, unit of experiments, say N in sequential probability ratio tests, you take each observation and after each observation, you look at the uh, uh, likelihood ratio and stop sampling according to the criteria that is presented uh, in this setting. Uh, either the beta over one minus alpha or one over beta over uh, alpha, uh, where alpha and beta are type one and type two error probabilities. And what he showed, uh, was that the expected sample size n is much smaller than the typically smaller than the uh, fixed sample size? That's how you, you know, achieve the savings in in the cost of experimentation. So the on the left hand panel you see a, a typical shape of the uh, sequential probability ratio boundary where uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the sample size N that is variable. And then the uh, uh, Y axis, you have essentially a, a partial sum of the observations. And so this simple versus simple alternative hypothesis was uh, converted into a test of the null hypothesis. The sample mean is zero against the alternative, the sample mean is different from, I mean, the population mean is different from zero by, you know, duplicating the test of the null hypothesis in both directions. And that was de Hello? developed by Sobel and Walt. Yes? Dr. Yes. Kim, yeah, I, I think we cannot see the slides. You right? cannot see the slide? Uh, we can only, I personally can only, see, I can only see the first slide. So I'm stuck there. And oh. initially, yeah. Uh, I was thinking that that. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you're uh, right. I get a signal. Sharing supposed to bring your shared window to the front. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. Were, uh, you had the 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 document open twice or something. Oh no! The only thing I see is this screen because how about I stop sharing and start again? All right. Okay. okay. So I'm back to the original shape and uh, let me share the screen. Oh, and maybe because, you know, hold on a sec. Can you see that? Yes. Yes, okay. now no, it's fine. Oh, okay. I hope it doesn't create any more problems. 
Can you so, skip back and forth just to test it? Skip back and forth on the slide. Right, you're right. So let me just do that. So when I click on the screen, I yeah. can go back okay. and forth. Do you that see? It seems to be working. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So this is where uh, the slide seven was when I uh, uh, left up. So Wald's idea of uh, one sort of a tail decision making was expanded to a two tailed sort of uh, decision making by Sobel and Wald in 1949. And this idea was further you know, developed. So since then, uh, Peter Armitage uh, published a book called Sequential Medical Trials in uh, 1960. And the reason for considering sequential method is, is for the ethical reasons that you uh, do not uh, want to continue experimentation beyond the point where you have an answer to the question. Because for example, if you're doing a, a placebo control trial, uh, control and the, uh, uh, the experimental uh, intervention is beneficial, continuing randomization means depriving the patient with the opportunity to benefit from the uh, 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 new treatment, uh, those on placebo. So there's a ethical imperative to terminate the trial early when you have an answer to the question, both in terms of the benefit and also in terms of the risks to the uh, participants. So this idea uh, was further sort of developed by uh, Peter Armitage uh, by modifying the two-sided version of the sequential probability ratio test by Sobel and Wall. Uh, and then uh, Peter Armitage, uh, along with his uh, uh, students and uh, junior colleagues, developed what is, came to be known as the repeated significance test. So here's the shape of the uh, restricted plan so Peter Armitage put a maximum sample size for the sequential uh, sort of inspection of the, uh, 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 the patients for the say by getting rid of the inner wedges of the sol uh, Sobel and Wall's two-tailed uh, sequential probability ratio test. And then this idea concept was developed into what came to be known as a sequential probability ratio test, which we're gonna look at it. And these uh, our the operating characteristics are very similar to each other. So restricted significance test. The idea at the time, uh, there was a lot of controversy according to whether you believe in the Bayesian principle or a likelihood principle. Uh, so what Peter Armitage decided to do is, what if you conduct sequential application of standard test multiple times? What happens to the uh, uh, this frequentist notion of a you know false positive error probabilities? So he looked at the uh, series of independent Gaussian variables with uh, uh, mean mu and say variance one, and look at the partial sum uh, of the observations SK, and consider testing the null hypothesis whether mean is equal to zero or not. And if, like in fixed sample situations, you will terminate the trial if the partial sum exceeds some boundary. So that boundary became some constant uh, C sub alpha uh, times the square root of K. C sub alpha is the constant that'll give you the desired uh, overall significance level of alpha, uh, knowing that you are going to uh, conduct this uh, a sequential testing for some fixed number of times, the maximum number of times. So you can actually look at the probability distribution of this uh, 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 optional stopping time, K star or early stopping time. Uh, and this can be found uh, exactly by recursive integration formula given here. And it is possible because if you look at the partial sum S, uh, S sub K at the Kth stage, it is just a, a sum of the partial sum at the k minus first stage plus the new observation yk. And because uh, this is a partial sum of the independent uh, Gaussian variable, s of k minus one and yk are independent. So in order to determine the uh, 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 probability distribution for the partial sum in sk, you have to look at the convolution of SK minus one and the next observation YK. 
And that's why you could do this calculation, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, K that is greater than two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. So what he did one of, as a, one of the first exercises is that if you apply this test once and see alpha say of point, uh, 1.96, which is the critical value for two tail test for a significant level of 0 0.05, you get that desired uh, type of error probability. If you apply that test twice at the you know typical uh, criteria 1.96, the actual type of error probabilities become 0 0.08. And if you conduct that the, the test like 10 times, uh, and eventually this false positive probability eventually becomes one. So he did these calculations to demonstrate to the uh, Bayesians who says that you don't have to do any adjustment. The same, you don't have to make any adjustment with a you know multiplicity of testing. So it's part of the multiple testing issues when you have the information being accumulated over time. But this had a very nice uh, uh, implication uh, in the future as we're gonna see shortly. So, but the issue with the, uh, this traditional early sequential method, when you look at the accumulated data, one observation uh, after each observation, it's simply not gonna be uh, possible with a very complex uh, a, a, a clinical trials where there's a multiple sites are involved, data come in in a trickling fashion. So the solution that was uh, even suggested as early as in 1947 in Walls, uh, textbook, I mean the, uh, the seminal book on sequential analysis, is to take uh, is to take a groups of observations and apply sequential probability ratio test for binary outcome. That was one of the first time someone suggested this idea of looking at the groups of observation instead of after each individual observation. And then Elfrey and Schultz in 1973 biometrics publication officially used this term, group sequential method for the first time in the literature uh, for clinical trials uh, with a binary outcome. They were statisticians working for a Upjohn, which eventually became sort of absorbed into Pfizer. And Polka uh, in UK, who was doing clinical trials, following this idea of a repeated confidence uh, significance test by Armitage, McPherson and Rowe, sort of popularized this group sequential method for clinical trials with Gaussian outcome. So let's just think about how group sequential method works. Uh, and it's very good to start with a fixed sample size. Suppose you are comparing treatment A versus B. Suppose outcomes are sort of a continuous outcome uh, following Gaussian uh, distribution with means mu sub A and mu sub B with say known uh, variance, common known variance sigma squared, just to make the uh, mathematics a little uh, less uh, cumbersome. And you are interested in testing whether the difference in the unknown mean is delta is zero or not, because that's what typically clinical trials are interested in demonstrating, whether treatment A is better than treatment B or worse than treatment B, so that the future patient can benefit from a better treatment. So if you were to design a, a clinical trial uh, with a fixed sample size, uh, somehow uh, you, know, you will come up with a sample size and for each of the treatment, and you enroll a total of two N subjects. And at the end, you form a typical standardized test statistic. And if that absolute value is greater than 1.6, you will reject the null hypothesis of no difference uh, at a significant level of, of 0.05, right? How can this concept can be expanded into where groups of observations are taken instead of all at once? So the idea of this group sequential method is we monitor accumulating data over time. And while we are accumulating them, if large treatment differences uh, emerge, you may wish to terminate the study early. And so group sequential method call for monitoring periodically after groups of observations become available uh, based on group sequential test. So the way it is done is 
sort of performing what is known as an interim analysis of the accumulating data after every two N observation and on each treatment for a maximum of K times. So you can think of group sequential method with capital K equal to one as a special case of fixed sample test. And so a group sequential test will reject the null hypothesis H0 if at any of the interim analysis test statistic becomes sufficiently large. And what we learned from the repeated significance test that uh, Armitage has looked at is that if you are going to look at the accumulating data more than once, then you cannot use the typical fixed sample critical value 1.96 as a criteria for uh, uh, rejecting the null hypothesis. So a number of people came up with a different sort of criteria. One way to think about this problem is at each interim analysis, you think about the accumulated data summarized in YJ. So it's a standardized uh, between the sample mean uh, for treatment A and treatment B, where each sample mean is uh, based on uh, observation of N. So group sequential test will reject the null hypothesis if for the first time, when the absolute value of the partial sum yk, which is the sum of y's uh, from y1 to yk, becomes greater than some uh, uh, value b sub k. And we call that group sequential boundaries. So in order to uh, ensure that the overall type of error probability are maintained at alpha, that is desired, say 0.05 or whatever, then you would like to pick this group sequential boundary Bs in such a way the probability of partial sum being less than these boundary values all throughout is going to be one minus alpha. That means the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis either at the first analysis, second analysis, and so forth, all the way to the kth analysis will be alpha. So that's why in order to be able to determine this group sequential boundaries, you have to understand the joint distribution of this kth dimensional sequential test statistics. And what we learned is that it's not as straightforward, but uh, there were some standard group sequential method was pr proposed by uh, most prominent is the Polkog in 1977. His boundary was some constant that depends on alpha and the maximum number of analysis k uh, multiplied by square root of k. So you, knowing that as k is some sort of partial sum, if you standardize it as an absolute value z's k as sk divided by square root of k, you will reject the null hypothesis the first time when the standardized statistic exceeds a constant critical value c uh, K. And particularly, a uh, typical example of uh, alpha 0.05, and if you're going to do the uh, interim analysis, including the final up to five times, that constant critical value becomes 2.41. Now, if capital K was one, this CP is simply 1.96. So if you do more and more tests, this critical value becomes larger and larger to maintain the overall significance level at uh, uh, say whatever is desired, say 0.05. O'Brien and Fleming uh, came up with a different sort of an idea of uh, rejecting the null hypothesis the first time when the partial sum exceeds a constant boundary value V sub K. So that boundary value V sub K is given by some form of a constant times the square root of the maximum number of analysis, capital K. So again, if you consider alpha of 0.05 and capital K of five, then this constant becomes 2.04 with a boundary value remaining constant at 4.48. Now, you probably recognize in this discussion for po both Polkag and O'Brien, we are assuming that accumulating data after each interim analysis, in terms of statistical information is the same, right? Because we are assuming two N observations from uh, each stages. And the observations that we assumed was the normal outcomes. So partial sum S1 and S2 
If you look at the increments, S2 minus S1, that's independent of S1 because a new set of observations. If you look at partial sum S3, the S2 and S2, S3 minus 2 is also independent because they are uh, a contribution from the new set of observations. So the uh, uh, repeated significance testing way of calculating the boundary can be applied. But uh, as soon as you leave this setting, so I talk, so this is the typical shape of the, uh, uh, so this uh, closed circle uh, boundary is the O'Brien and Fleming, and open circle is the uh, uh, Pocock boundary. And Peter Haybiddle came up with some uh, other boundaries, but uh, which is not important for our discussion. But there are situations, this approach is limited in the sense that uh, the increment between the successive test statistic may not be identical. Because in clinical trial, you cannot ensure that because the you know, enrollment will fluctuate and data coming in will fluctuate. So you need a flexible procedures to deal with the uh, situation where the uh, mean for the uh, KF group is different you know, from step to step. Worse yet, if the increments are not independent, then the recursive numerical integration formula uh, that uh, allows you to deal with uh, uh, you know, any number of sort of uh, interim analysis that is no longer available. So with the situation where there's a, a non-identical uh, increments of uh, uh, information uh, to handle that, Slot and Way came up with the idea of allocating what they call exit probability. So exit probability sequence pi one down to pi k adds up to alpha to maintain the overall group sequential test level at 0.05 say, for example. And given the pi k, you can determine the group sequential boundaries uh, in such a way the probability statement given here maintains this uh, designated pi k. So you start with the first pi one, that's a univariate calculation, you can determine B1. Given pi two, you make sure that, you know, uh, S1 stays within the boundary, but S2 exceeds the boundary. That probability becomes pi two and so forth. Generalizing this idea further, Lan and Demetz in 1983 came up with the uh, uh, idea of specifying a monotonically increasing type one error spending function alpha star p such that alpha star at zero is equal to zero and alpha star at one is equal to alpha. So that given alpha star of p, the exit probabilities are determined as an increment uh, between the alpha star at two different time points, tk and tk minus one, okay? So that's one way to handle non-identically distributed increments. But when you have a correlated increments across the uh, sequential test statistic, uh, one has to resort to a multivariate numerical integration. Uh, there's a procedure developed uh, uh, by uh, Mark Shervish in 1984, published in the uh, Applied Statistics uh, Algorithms sort of section, known as a Malnor program. But it's very difficult and extremely intensive numerically, and it can only handle up to seven dimensions. So if you're going to do a, a clinical trial where the accumulating data will be analyzed uh, more than seven times, you're out of luck. You just cannot do that. But people realize that if the test statistic have independent increment, as we saw with the recursive, I mean, repeated significance test, then you can uh, do the uh, multivariate uh, numerical integration uh, because it becomes a simple univariate integration involving simple recursion uh, by convolution as in the repeated significance test. So when I say is an independent increment uh, means that covariance between the partial sum and SK and the increment between the uh, ELF analysis and KTH analysis, the difference increment is equal to zero or equivalently if the covariance between SK and SL is equal to variance of SK, okay? Then this complex problem can be 
turned into a, 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 a numerical procedure that uh, Armitage, McPherson, and Roll has developed for uh, repeated significance test. Any, any questions or comments so far? Okay, if not, then so people start to think about what kind of test statistic have this independent increment so that you can apply the standard proof sequential method. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have a Gaussian observation, okay, uh, which is observed only once, it is quite intuitive that the proof sequential test statistic would have independent increments because new set of observations are independent from the uh, observations from the previous uh, uh, patients, right? So you can apply the standard proof sequential method by Pocock and O'Brien and Flemings with a, you know, slot and way or uh, land and demet approach. Now think about the clinical trials where you have a longitudinal measurement taken repeatedly from each participant. Each subject repeats follow up data multiple times. Suppose when you do the first intimate analysis, first 10 patients contributed, you know, up to two follow up visits, and the remaining, you know, 30 patients have only one follow up visit. But suppose you wait until the second intimate analysis. First group of 10 patients may have by then you know, four follow-up data. And we know that measurements taken from the same patients are presumably correlated. So it is not intuitively clear whether the uh, sequential testing will, will have independent increments. Likewise, if you think about times to event data, like failure time data, so a lot of the cardiovascular uh, disease or, or, or advanced renal uh, 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 impairments, you know, uh, and uh, cardiovascular disease. Often we're interested in looking at patient uh, time to all cause mortality. So again, when the patient uh, is enrolled and then they are followed until they die during the study. And when you conduct the first interim analysis, a lot of patients will have a censored observation, but we know that when you do the uh, times to event analysis, even the censored observations make contribution, right? So suppose one patient had a, you know, uh, uh, enrolled in, you know, two years ago, I'm doing the instrument analysis, that patient had a two years worth of follow-up data. But if the patient hasn't died, and if you look at the patient uh, uh, one year later, that patient may have contributed another year of follow-up or may have contributed half a year of follow-up with a death. So if you look at the accumulating data uh, during the first analysis and the second analysis, there's two components of data contributed by the same patient. There's no, uh, uh, it's not obvious whether that contribution will be independent. But interestingly enough, going back to as early as 1975 in Peter Armitage's second edition of sequential medical uh, trials, he makes a conjecture that even for failure time data subject to random sampling, probably log rank test type of statistic will have independent increments. So number of us in clinical trial arena started to look at the situations where that would be the case. So the remaining part of my presentation will be discussing some of that examples. So longitudinal trials, measurements taken repeatedly from each subject over a scheduled follow-up time and due to apparent correlation among repeated measurements from the same subject, it just simply, uh, it just seems natural for the increments to be uh, uh, correlated. But then going back to the uh, 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 early 1990s, uh, people have come up with those clever solutions that establishes independent increment structure. And uh, there are some examples based on random effects model by uh, Nan Laird and uh, uh, Jim Ware, uh, the, the 1982 biometrics paper. Initially thought that that model does not lead to independent increment, but with this clever formulation of the problem, uh, Lee and Demet show that e even in that setting, you could have independent increments. And then, you know, uh, semi-parametric approach based on generalized estimating equation is widely used, uh, you know, since uh, uh, late 1980s in analyzing longitudinal measurement. And so people started to apply that in clinical trials. So, 
I will uh, uh, sort of skip in the interest of time random effects model and go straight to uh, the uh, semi-parametric model. So even this approach uh, in uh, 1990, uh, L.J. Wei, uh, his student, uh, John Su and uh, uh, John Lakin proposed a group sequential test based on semi-parametric model for longitudinal data uh, using the uh, generalized estimating equations approach by Liang and Zieger, but uh, they show that their sequentially computed test statistic uh, results in correlated increments. But it was uh, my work with my former student, Sandra Lee, and my uh, mentor, uh, Siaras, in 1995, we showed that sequentially computed score and wall test statistics based on the GE approach can also have asymptotic independent increments if the variance structure among repeated measurement is either correctly specified, which is often not, we don't know that, but at least if it is uh, consistently estimated, you think GE2 so let's just take a look at that. So here's the notation. Y I J uh, I K uh, is a, a vector of repeated measurements from subject I at the time of the K the instrument analysis uh, with Y I J K uh, denoting the J repeated measurements. And we have the uh, covariate vector X I K uh, including the treatment in, uh, indicator and the T I as a time of entry. So marginal mean of Y I K given uh, xik can be expressed in this format uh, through the uh, link function g. And so this, we can sort of uh, think about partitioning the parameter space into two components beta one, a parameter that affects the treatment effect and theta, which includes rest of them as a nuisance parameter. So variance matrix, uh, can be assumed in this form given yik, variance of, uh, I mean, xik, variance of yik as some uh, unknown function h of xik with a, a parameter beta and alpha is used to indicate the variance parameter uh, as a vik. So vik is referred to as the working pro, uh, uh, variance covariance matrix while uh, we can indicate the uh, true unknown variance covariance matrix as a uh, script uh, VI sub K. And choosing the parameterization of the uh, VIK through the use of uh, this uh, uh, variance parameter alpha allows sufficient flexibility to approximate uh, the uh, true VIK well enough. And in fact, that's the key. So the following theory that we have developed works if the variance structure is either correctly specified, which is oftentimes not the case because we just don't know the variance structure well enough, but, or it, it can be consistently estimated. That's around the time when the uh, 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 Liang and Ziga student, Baja uh, uh, Katish came up with a you know, GE2 approach, okay? So we are sort of relying that uh, on that publication in 1990. The score function at the time of the k to analysis, or in a usual sort of a, a score function, can be written in this format. So the last, you know, indicator function is that the uh, patient entry time into the clinical trial is before the time of the uh, interim analysis, so that that uh, participant makes contribution. And otherwise, the rest of the format is the same form. I mean, yik minus mu ik, a known mean function, and inverse of the uh, variance function. And then there's the weight, which is a, a differential of the mean function with respect to the uh, parameter of interest. So you can partition the score function uh, into two parts, one involving parameter of interest that is associated with the treatment effect and the rest of the parameter. So, S sub K beta one denotes the score function with respect to beta one and S sub K theta denotes the score vector with respect to the nuisance parameters theta. Okay. So asymptotic normality of the sequential score vector uh, can be uh, uh, shown as follows. When the variance matrix of repeated measurement is assumed to be correct, that is if VI is uh, a square VI, then 
this uh, standardized, you know, uh, root n standardized uh, the uh, uh, score function sk beta alpha have a, a zero mean uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution with asymptotic variance uh, given in this notation. And that's just the standard results from the uh, GE approach. In addition, the sequentially computed score statistic uh, 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 have a, a independent increment structure. That is, if you look at the a partial, I mean, the uh, score process at time k and time l, the covariance is equal to the variance of the uh, score uh, statistic at time k, showing that there's an independent increment. That means you can use the standard uh, group sequential method uh, even with the longitudinal data. So. Oftentimes we don't know the exact, uh, you know, uh, variance structure. We have to sort of estimate them. So now we get into the sort of a, a profile score uh, under the null hypothesis, beta one equal beta one zero, which is what we are interested in. Distance parameter, which is in this one, where theta hat is the restricted GEE estimate of theta. Uh, given beta one at beta one uh, uh, superscript zero. So this is the GE estimate of the nuisance parameter theta under the null hypothesis, which can be done using the standard GE sort of a machinery. And according to Radnitsky and Jewel's uh, 1990 biometrical paper, the score test is equivalent uh, to the partial profile score given in this manner. So this is T, uh, as a partial uh, uh, score function, as a combination linear function of the components of the uh, a, a score function. So this is the uh, score uh, uh, function uh, with respect to beta one, and you have the score function with respect to the nuisance parameter pre-multiply by the variance component. And so since the, uh, this T statistic is a linear combination of the elements of the score function, this again follows the normal distribution where the variance component is given as the inverse of the you know, leading component of the variance matrix. And in addition, it can be easily shown that the covariance of the uh, uh, root n standardized, uh, this uh, profile score function TK and TL has the variance uh, for TK, showing that it has independent increment. So this implies that the sequentially computed score test converges in distribution to zero mean multivariate Gaussian with independent increment. That allows us to apply the standard method uh, that is offered by Polcock and O'Brien and Fleming. You don't have to have a special machinery to uh, determine the boundary values. Now let's switch our gears to failure time data. Again, for the same reason with the uh, failure time data, each subject potentially contributes uh, statistical information to the uh, uh, sequential test more than once. And so it is not intuitively clear, obvious that sequentially computed test statistics can also have independent increments. And, but again, even in this unlikely setting, sequentially computed test statistics uh, uh, was shown to have independent increments. One of the first person to show that rigorously is Butch Tsiaras uh, uh, in his 1981 uh, Biometrica paper. Essentially, he showed that under the proportional hazard model, the efficient scores test, which is equivalent to log rank test, having independent increments. Because this is log rank test is one of the most widely used test statistic for in uh, uh, clinical trials with the times the event outcome, they made the application of standard methods in a, a clinical trials with a chronic uh, disease with a time to event outcome. So that was done. And then uh, I happened to have the occasion to think about different type of problem where we needed a general solution uh, for a sort of parametric model. So. I'll skip the development uh, that uh, a number of people have looked at on the proportional hazard model and go right to the situation uh, for a very general sort of parametric model. So 
we view the uh, review the joint distribution of sequentially computed score and wall test or general parametric model for failure time data subject to censoring. And as I'll say, I'll tell you uh, shortly, it was specifically motivated by a clinical trial setting where there appears to be a, a sizable portion of participants being cured of disease. So we have to think about the mixture model that Bern Farewell uh, proposed in 1982. And we wanted to solve that problem, whether we can apply the Vern Farewell's model in, in clinical trial where a sizable chunk of participants appear to be cured of disease. As we, most of you know, pediatric tumors, uh, we have a lot of uh, 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 patients being cured of disease. You know, uh, early stage breast cancer doesn't kill people. So a lot of patients live long and we consider them to be cured of uh, you know, breast cancer. There are a number of situations where this type of a uh, uh, cure rate model can be applied. So that led to our paper, uh, with uh, my former student, Ellen. I would like to sort of review how that works. So here's a notation, typical, you know, randomized control trial with a timed event outcome when the patients are entering the trial in a sort of a, 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 a you know, what is known as a, a sequential manner. So E sub I indicate the positive boundary entry time. So it could be calendar time or we can use whatever, uh, you know, uh, time scale. XI is the potential failure time with the potential censoring time indicated as a VI. So uh, for each patient, we have a uh, observed data into XI of T, where T is the time when you are doing the analysis. So it's simply a maximum, the minimum of XI, VI, and T minus EI, and the uh, uh, zero. Because if the patient hasn't entered the trial by the time you did the analysis, that patient will not have any contribution. Likewise, we would determine the uh, event indicator delta. And there's the uh, covariate uh, associated with the I participant, including the treatment indicator. So the hazard function uh, is a fully, uh, can be written as a fully parametric model with this uh, 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 parameter set. Again, we have the beta as the parameter of interest associated with the treatment indicator and the rest of them is a vector of nuisance parameter. So if you assume exponential model, that'll be the situation where lambda is just the hazard function. So, if the data are analyzed at time t, observable random variables are xit, delta it, and zi, and the likelihood function can be written in a typical format uh, as shown here. And so the score vector can be, again, you know, as the uh, uh, derivative of the log likelihood, uh, can be partitioned into two pieces. So I just use the subscript zero to indicate the uh, treatment effect, uh, I mean, the uh, score vector corresponding to the treatment effect and the uh, second component corresponding to the uh, uh, nuisance parameter, okay? So the setting is very similar, partitioning the score vector uh, this way. And so the key result is that the, uh, again, root and standardized this score test have a zero mean multivariate Gaussian distribution with covariance matrix with the elements uh, A sub J, J prime, T, K, T, L, uh, being the same as uh, uh, A sub J, J prime, TK and TK, indicating that there's uh, independent uh, increments in the uh, covariance matrix structure. So you let the P plus one by P plus one asymptotic covariance matrix of the score vector evaluated at time T with elements A, J, J prime, T, T uh, being partitioned into the leading component a sub double zero and off diagonal and the uh, uh, main diagonal component uh, for the nuisance uh, parameter. And then usual inverse of that expressed, this expression should be now kind of looking familiar from the longitudinal model where we use the uh, capital gamma, right? So following the Cox and Hinckley's profile score, the score test for the null hypothesis that beta is equal to beta zero for the uh, uh, in the presence of nuisance parameter, the rest of them theta, 
is given by the restricted, I mean, this fun, uh, format, where theta hat is the restricted MLE of theta when beta is equal to beta zero. And according to the standard likelihood theory, this score test is asymptotically equivalent to the profile score. Very similar notation, we stick with the profile score uh, function T, which is a linear combination of the components of the score vector, okay? S zero and S theta, pre-multiplied by the uh, orthogonal component of the variance matrix and the inverse of the, uh, uh, the nuisance component of the variance covariance matrix. And it follows the same. Since the uh, 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 root n standardized uh, profile likely uh, profile score is a linear combination of the elements of the score vector, they also follow the uh, asymptotic normal distribution with the independent increment structure in terms of the uh, profile uh, score uh, uh, test T, okay? So this implies that the sequentially computed score test uh, uh, score vector converges in distribution to zero mean multivariate Gaussian with independent increment structure. Again, under the very general uh, parametric model setting, we now can rely on this independent increment structure uh, with the uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution so that we can apply the standard method uh, as provided by Pocock, Overend and Fleming, and the flexibility offered it by Slot and Weyer, uh, 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 land demands approach. Uh, just as a side, I serve on a number of data monitoring committees for a, a, a pharmaceutical company uh, trials intended for registration with the uh, health authorities. And invariably, these protocols involve a, a, a group sequential methods based on this type of approach. In fact, just this afternoon, I got a notification from the, one of the sponsors. We held a meeting the beginning of February and after the first interim analysis, the test result was so good. We recommended uh, unblinding the study and inform the participants. And with that, the sponsor can uh, put together a package. So the reason why it took two months for the sponsor to contact us again is because there was a negotiation discussion with the, uh, in this case, Food and Drug Administration to get clearance to submit marketing approval based on this interim results. So this results was reached after the first formal interim analysis. So this is how these methods are used, not only for the academically conducted, you know, publicly funded clinical trials, but also for the privately, uh, uh, you know, company sponsored clinical trials. So let me just sort of uh, share uh, some examples uh, uh, to illustrate the uh, existence of uh, independent increment structure for uh, large seasonal data and time to event data, failure time data. So we decided to look at the uh, uh, data set from the uh, National uh, Cooperative Ballstone Study. And they were looking at an agent known as a kinodiol to dissolve the gallstone, which is an implication for cholesterol level. So this study involved, uh, they were interested in uh, knowing whether kinodiol as a pharmaceutical intervention is beneficial uh, for the patient with a gallstone condition or not. So they conducted the uh, uh, placebo controlled trial, but they were looking at uh, two different dose levels of kinodiol, high dose and low dose. For the illustrative purpose, I will just gonna share the data uh, based on the high dose group. And both group had a uh, 305 subject. The total study had uh, almost a 9,000, I mean, 900 patients. The marginal density of the uh, uh, repeated measures cholesterol values, they measured in addition to baseline uh, B, they measured this cholesterol level at month six, month 12, 18 and 24. And so one way to sort of model this thing is a simple sort of a linear model. Uh, 
illustrated below. Our primary interest is in the treatment indicator Z, so kinodial one, placebo zero, and looking at whether beta one is equal to zero or not. If beta one is equal to zero, that means kinodial has no effect uh, as compared to the placebo. But if kinodial beta uh, one is different from zero, that means kinodial has an effect that is different from a placebo. So what I'm showing here is simply the estimated covariance matrix using the generalized estimating equation approach, assuming no known uh, variance covariance matrix structure. We just uh, uh, estimated the uh, covariance variance matrix using the Pearson residual. And what you see here for the score test is that the uh, uh, variance covariance for the first component with the rest of the, so there was a total of four interim analysis, they are the same, indicating that the, uh, uh, there's an independent increment. Second analysis with the second and third and fourth analysis, they are the same level. Third and if you look at the West statistic, the variance covariance structure is sort of kind of different in the sense that your variance covariance of say test statistic at K and L is equal to the variance, uh, variance of the uh, later stage. <laughs> That's why variance covariance at uh, stage one and two is the same as the variance of stage two. Variance covariance of stage one and three, two and three is the same as the variance of the stage three and so forth. So both test statistic score test or wall test indicates that there's an independent increment structure allowing us to use the uh, standard method. Here's the uh, simulation study. How are we doing? I don't have the time, but uh, yeah, this is simple. So we just decided to look at an exponential model with a hazard function, even in this form. So this hazard function depends on the treatment uh, through beta and the entry time into the study through uh, theta two. So the parameter of interest is beta, and we're interested in testing whether beta is equal to zero or not, with theta one and theta two serving as the nuisance parameter. So again, in this case, we generated a, a, a <coughs> simulated data under this model, and we looked at the empirical correlation matrix of the increments of the score test, and the uh, correlation diagonal is one and off diagonal is very uh, small, clo getting close to zero. We also did the same exercise looking at the empirical correlation matrix of the increments of the wall uh, test statistic pre-multiplied by the information, uh, observed information. And again, off diagonal elements are, are clo uh, getting close to zero, indicating that with the, the moderate sample size, these test statistics uh, have independent increment. And here's the real example that really got us motivated. This was a children's cancer study group, study 251. The primary results after the, the study was conducted as a fixed sample study published in 1993. This study involved a induction chemotherapy and followed by either allogeneic bone marrow transplant because it was the time when People are investigating whether giving a, a bone marrow transplant would sort of uh, uh, maintain the induction response for those children with untreated acute myeloid leukemia. So post remission treatment was determined by whether patient had a, a, a human leukocyte antigen matching sibling donors or not. So th the question we are looking at is, is giving the uh, uh, HLA sibling match donor, allogeneic uh, bone marrow transplant is beneficial as compared to the standard of care, which was the uh, more of the you know, toxic chemotherapy. The patient entered between September 1979 and October 1983, a total of 340 patients achieved remission, that is uh, disappearance of the initial uh, tumor mass, 
and they were subsequently allocated to either uh, transplant or chemotherapy, not by randomization, but by availability of the HLA, uh, HLA matching a sibling donor, uh, meaning allogeneic bone transplantation. And they're interested in looking at disease-free survival from the end of induction. And in this uh, study, there was a sizable proportion of patients being cured of disease. And so standard, you know, has a, 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 a model of which didn't work. So we have to think about sort of cure rate model as shown here. So uh, we kind of uh, mimic how this trial would have happened if we were to conduct the instrument analysis in October of 1982. October of 1983 and October of 1984. And by that time, uh, the number of children enrolled by that cutoff point was 255, 324, and 340. And as I indicated, this took this long to publish, 1983. So we just, uh, there was a uh, uh, two-component mixture model uh, with a, a, a those cured of disease was indicated with this cure rate uh, 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 nu sub zero expressed as a, a logistic function, and the others who are non-cured uh, following this viable survival function. So in this case, we are interested in knowing whether the cure rate is different between the two groups through beta and the, all the other parameter, alpha and gamma zero, gamma one and delta became a, a nuisance parameter. So we sort of pretended that the study was ongoing. We are applying either score function, a score test or a wall test using the error spending function that gives the, uh, uh, the boundary shape very much like O'Brien and Fleming. So this is actually a Brownian motion process hitting a constant boundary. So there's the connection between Brownian motion process hitting constant boundary and the O'Brien and Fleming uh, tested, I mean, the group sequential method. That's the sort of a background there. So this one shows the uh, estimate of the treatment effect in terms of the, uh, the uh, proportion cure the beta and variance estimate and the a, what we call information time that corresponds to uh, these three time points, October of 2018, uh, uh, 1982, October 1983, October 1984. And because of different test statistics, it gives rise to different, that uh, time as the information time what we call, and the corresponding use of the uh, alpha spending function. I should have indicated alpha star subscript OF, O'Brien and Fleming. And this is the observed test statistic score test. And this is the wall test. And the critical value determined using over uh, 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 land emits approach. And if we, if the study were uh, monitored using interim analysis, they could have published the study 10 years earlier. Because according to this score test statistic, the first time the, uh, the test statistics 1.29, critical value is 3.88 that you couldn't uh, reject. And uh, by the third analysis, you would have rejected the null hypothesis. I apologize, I should have used the uh, subscript B here uh, to indicate the boundary. So, Either test could have led to an early termination and have this information out to the scientific and clinical community shortly after 19, you know, uh, uh, 84, instead of having to wait for another 10 years to get the results out. So this is how important these method is because the patient, so between 1984 and 1993, patient would not have to, even the physician would not have to worry about how best to treat patients because they have a solid result showing the benefit of the uh, allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. So the patients after October, 1984, I mean, usually it takes a year to publish, at least from 1985, the patient could have received allogeneic 
uh, transplant patient instead of receive, having, receive, having to receive the chemotherapy. So in conclusion, uh, I'd like to state, uh, uh, I mean, I like to conclude by stating that group sequential methods are used very widely in large scale randomized control trials uh, in chronic disease setting, cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, you know, uh, 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 a, a kidney disease, diabetes. I mean, there is so many of them. And uh, what we have shown is that even in uh, unlikely and not so intuitive setting, there often is an independent increment structure in the uh, uh, properly chosen constructed, uh, you know, uh, uh, sequential uh, test statistic and its joint distribution. And we have shown through a simulation and with the real data example, that uh, indicated that this theory is, appears to work out even with a moderate sample size. And the most important message that if the independent increment structure holds true, even with a very unlikely setting with a longitudinal or failure time data, that means you can apply the standard group sequential methods developed by Paul Kagan over on Fleming. And clinical trials uh, like these are conducted these days. So, with that, I'll conclude my presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So, I just like to acknowledge my former mentor, with whom I had so much fun when I was at Harvard from 1986 uh, through 1995. Uh, he met a, a, a wife while I was there, and. Uh, he followed his wife to North Carolina State University. <laughs> his wife is Marita Vidian, who has done a lot of work in uh, longitudinal data modeling. And my former student, Sandra Lee, who is uh, still at uh, Dana Farber Cancer Institute and the Harvard School of Public Health. Ellen Boucher, she had, uh, she kind of disappeared. She's from uh, Laval University in Canada. I just couldn't uh, locate her. <laughs> what happened was that she was she got a, a job with the AIDS clinical trial group at Harvard School of, of Public Health after she finished uh, her PhD. And then she just happens to be in Canada when 9-11 happened. She couldn't come back to the country when immediate shock was to sort of lock down the border. So she just decided to sort of not bother to come back. And since that time, I lost contact, unfortunately. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor, for all of this uh, amazing information. And uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, deep journey, I think, in, in so many ways. I went, yeah. well, I went to, I went to, um, Ask if there are uh, uh, questions from. Yeah, if there's any question. I mean, how many of you uh, are familiar with the clinical trials? Probably, yes. Uh huh. Larry does, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing clinical trials uh, since 1984. <laughs> and uh, I do clinical trial. And uh, my methodological research is mostly uh, motivated and driven by clinical trials. And I find a lot of you know, fun uh, doing that. So yeah, nowadays I uh, mentor. So for example, I recently finished uh, a 5,300 patient cardiovascular clinical trial with the NHLBI funding. And the uh, publication just came out in the uh, American Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, the first issue of this year. And the way, well, so this was an influenza vaccine study. It, the study itself is very interesting. Initially, we designed this trial as a, you know, uh, a randomization once and the patient come back to get the same vaccination uh, year after year. Mm. But then, so the trial was designed as a traditional, you know, intent to treat analysis from first year vaccination to whenever that uh, event that we are looking at, all cause mortality or hospitalization due to uh, a myocardial infarction or heart failure. That was the primary endpoint. But then after we got approval from the NHLBI for the study and protocol, 
the PI was concerned about the fact that, you know, influenza itself is a different disease from year to year. As we all know, it comes with a different sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, antigen. And each year influenza vaccine itself is a different treatment, so to speak, because it, it includes different antibodies, right? So he wanted to, to change the trial in such a way that we look at the outcome per year of randomization. So the challenge is that those people who returned for the second vaccination, because we did not do randomization again, so the people who returned for the second vaccination between the people who received the high dose versus standard dose, they were no longer comparable because of differential event rate and differential dropout. So although it was a randomized control trial, we have to deal with a causal inference, <laughs> not for the first year of vaccination, but whenever they got the repeat vaccination. So that became a research question. So we are finishing up a manuscript. And in the meantime, my junior colleague brought a uh, uh, R01 is a grant mechanism where we get funding from the federal government. He got a further uh, funding to, 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 do the, to do this research. So that's how I have been operating as a statistician. I do clinical trials and other types of, uh, uh, you know, translational research. And I look at an opportunity to, for a different way of solving a different problem. Yeah. Mm. That's very interesting. I want to recall mm. different aspects of, of your talk, especially mm -hmm. the ethical, the ethical issues. With right. Mm -hmm. the, the need of this, uh, as you said, that you, dedicate yourself to solve uh, problems in a particular different way in order that right. things get together. And so mm -hmm. in special yeah. issues with ethical um, um, issues dealing together, especially for yes. example, one of, of the, <clears throat> the, the research I am uh, helping on uh, at the moment is, um, it's a meta-analysis that looks at uh, clinical trials, but that have been performed in people who cannot have a control group because these are uh, people who are on the terminal stage. Or oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, is this the metastatic metastatic uh, stage where they are? Yeah. So they are ba basically in pain and they cannot have a control group. And so right. uh -huh. each of the um, each of the 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 metrics in order to or the scales in order to uh, approach quality of the design of the research design, all uh -huh. of them use random randomization as one of the key aspects for for a good quality. Um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. However, in this context, we don't have those parameters. Otherwise, we will be uh, saying all of these studies are not performed. Uh, right. So, but, so, so let me answer the question uh, using the examples of uh, uh, a penicillin. Penicillin, when it was discovered by Fleming, they never did a controlled clinical trial mm -hmm. because the treatment effect was so dramatic. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. There was no ethical, you know, you just couldn't do experiment depriving the people not giving this treatment for ethical reason. So randomized controlled trial is the best uh, uh, known method to evaluate the competing treatment. But there are certain conditions has to be met. The other issue is that uh, oftentimes the progress is that we are making in medical field you don't see something like penicillin happening that very often. Even with the Ebola virus, uh, the, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a New England Journal publication. Uh, what was it like last year or a year before? Ebola virus pandemic happening, raging, you know, dropping people left and right, but they were developing vaccines, right? 
but they didn't know whether this vaccine is going to work or not. So they were able to do randomized controlled trials. And these are very important ethical issues. Now, you probably heard about you know, convalescent plasma in the setting of pandemic. Right? Mm -hmm. Mayo Clinic got some program put together. They enrolled over 30 some thousand patients. They still do not have the answer. Yeah. Their New England Journal publication was out of an observational study, they created a typical epidemiological study. They look at the people, their antibody level among those who receive uh, uh, plasma, and they look at the quintile of their antibody level. They didn't compare the all different levels. They just look at the first quintile and the fifth quintile, they showed benefit. Recently, I was on a data monitoring committee for a convalescent plasma patient, I mean, the, the trial funded by NHLBI. The study showed no benefit. Yeah. But, but I have a question there. How they took a, or any decision regarding to those scientific trials? Because here in Costa Rica, in our country, it was like a promise that is going, mm -hmm. going to want to work. And they were giving some hope to all the people here and they're still yes. working, and, and they're still working on on those treatments about plastic. Right, you see, that's the, that's the issue. Uh, so th there's a, a a very famous physician who passed away by now almost a, a 15 years ago, Thomas Chalmers. Mm -hmm. His argument, uh, he is a little uh, letter in the medical literature going back to 1974, mm -hmm. when you don't know the answer you start by randomizing with the very first patient. If the Mayo group started randomizing in March of last year, they would have had an answer. After a year, we still do not have an answer. That's very unethical. But what about our reality right now with the coronavirus? For example, AstraZeneca, it's a vaccine that is seen or is shown that have any results not very good for women specifically and uh, it takes some uh, damage to their brains also and, yeah. they're, and they're still using it so um, right but, but you know what here's mm -hmm. the issue if they mm -hmm. haven't done that study mm -hmm. okay if they haven't done the trial mm -hmm. and just giving the vaccine mm -hmm. just imagine how terrible the situation would have been you know, there's a lot of argument against the uh, randomization, mm -hmm. particularly those people in the Bayesian field. Oh, we don't need randomized control trial. We can do adaptive design or all of that. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, this pandemic showed that there's nothing better than randomized control trial. Okay. How BioNTech Pfizer got the data, okay. how Moderna got the data, it's through the randomized control trial. But how oh, yeah. people don't, don't realize how critical a tool this is when you do not know. That's right. I agree with that. But how so I always remind people, you know, Mayo enroll 33,000 patients. And in fact, in my own institute, one of these idiot physicians went onto the local newspaper, local TV. I said, oh, this thing works. And all the uh, NIH groups that, who's doing the study is not coming to our institution. Because you as a physician one day say that, oh, this thing works. And turn around, next patient comes to you. You ask them to be randomized. That's unethical. <laughs> but it's, so like, it, it, it's like giving a, a placebo to the people. We are giving placebos to people. Yeah. So the, one of the most important concepts with a randomized control trial is that there has got to be a clinical equipoise. That means you don't know which one works better. And if you as a physician ask the patient to be randomized in a trial when he or she personally feels that treatment A works better for the patient, that is being very unethical. This is very critical issues.
you have to be in your own mind uncertain about which treatment works for my patient. Only then you can ask the patient to be randomized. That's true. That's true. But uh, I have a question if I, if you let me. Sure. As, um, what about uh, the psychological mindset of the people right now? Because it seems like, for, for example, in the OMS, there is a lot of research that is going on that is shown that after uh, this, uh, I don't know, half of the year, people are going to get more disease in uh, depression, stress, and it's going to take your, uh, I don't know the word in English, I'm sorry, I, I apologize for that, sistema nervioso, uh, how you say that in English? Sistema nervioso? Nervous system? Yeah, thank you. Nervous oh, system. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's going to uh, blow the hell from your nervous system and it's going to um, shake another uh, diseases that maybe yeah. they are not related to the one that we are uh, right now in front of. Right. right, right, right. So uh, what about how you, how you measure that? How you control that? How you can say this is because of the effect of, for example, of the coronavirus, and there is another effect mm. that is going to happen. A lot of diseases are going to get stronger. Yeah. And how you can relate them or how you can separate them from yeah. the coronavirus, because in our country is doing a lot of stuff that people are seeing that um, if you have uh, been infected, the people around you all are infected. Uh, but not for sure because there is no clinical uh, um... right yeah yeah the situation with the corona uh, i mean the uh, pandemic is that we know so little mm -hmm. that's why there's so many clinical trials being conducted right now and when you say that someone is being infected by coronavirus you know the symptom you know spectrum is so different i mean just Give you an example. Some people, my younger brother and his wife was uh, came down. He almost lost his voice. It took him a while to recover his voice. But then I know a colleague in Barcelona. He's a statistician, Peter Puig. He was in ICU for six weeks, and during those six weeks, for two weeks, he was hooked up to ECMO, extracorporeal membrane uh, reoxygenation machine. And he's still not back, you know, because it's a single, you know, one the virus with mm -hmm. some, you know, variants. The, the, the manifestation of the symptom is so different and we don't even know how to predict who's going to get what. And we currently, large part of the medical establishment is mm -hmm. sort of a, operating in the, in the, in the, in, in the dark, really. Yeah, and yeah. it'll take at least two, three years to figure out. I mean, one thing that uh, I've seen the data is that, you know, the uh, uh, seasonal uh, uh, viral infection uh, from you know southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. I've seen the curve; it's flat. <laughs> there is no influenza; it's flat. There is no you know respiratory syncytial virus infection for little children infants. The line is flat. <laughs> and so, there are still people who doesn't believe in social distancing and masks. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, there's my point here. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but, but there is a point here. There, there is a point here. It seems like the effect of the cultural effect of the country and his of the values of the shared um, customs that they can right. be able to manage between people, mm -hmm. it's actually a, a good um, effect or predict oh, the yeah, way yeah. the way the coronavirus is going to be infected mm -hmm. or is going to is yeah, going to touch yeah. another people. But why then? And here I was talking to Milena um, hours ago, and I was telling her. In research of medical trials, for example, mm -hmm. why um, it doesn't expand uh, the knowledge to see uh, human behavior on, on different stages, for example, organizational behavior, 
yeah, family, yeah. family behavior uh, because they are very different. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I agree with you entirely because, you know, I always uh, tell my uh, statistical colleague who does really fancy experimental design, mm -hmm. you know, those people who used to work in the chemical, you know, process controls and whatnot, they have the ability to control so many things. Mm -hmm. In human clinical trials, most clinical trials are very simple, simple, complete uh, randomization, coin tossing. Mm. And we try to understand these issues mm -hmm. by collecting, you know, uh, uh, what we call covariate baseline characteristics of the patients in many different ways. But those of us who also look into causal inference, there's this issue of unmeasured confounders. Okay. Does any of these studies measure this sort of a cultural background information? No. No. If you don't collect the data, you cannot answer those but, questions, right? But we see those uh, we see those answers in the organizational stage. When we right. do yeah. when we do organization uh, investigation, right. we see those answers there. Why in medical research it hasn't been taken for granted? No, it does. I think what you're pointing. No, I think it, it because it's it's uh, it's just different levels of of evidence. I I will recall here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I mean, most mm -hmm. of the drug development these days happen in a global trial setting. Mm -hmm. Do they consider any of that? You know, I mean, we we do not even account for the differences in the medical delivery system between UK and United States is so vastly different. Even within the United States, University of Wisconsin's way of treating certain types of cancer is different from University of uh, uh, you know, Minnesota, for example. That's right. Mm -hmm. And we are just struggling with uh, answering a very simple questions in clinical trial. And we struggle with that. Mm. But there seems a way, opportunity to open that door too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons, you know, uh, even the United States National Institutes of Health, yeah. uh, the uh, behavioral intervention, psychosocial intervention studies was never featured on their page. Now, uh, as I have introduced earlier, they look at not only the, you know, health outcomes, but they also look at the biobehavioral outcomes. That's a, just a change in, in the last 10 years. Well, we hope to, Freddy, to work there. Do you have a question, Freddie? Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Sure, sure, I do. I, I was just waiting for my time. <laughs> I saw I, I, you. I, actually, I, sure, I, go ahead. Thank you, Jack, for, for your comments and questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, now I can give you the time. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. Okay. Sorry. No, it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, actually, Jack asked some, uh, several questions I had in mind as well, because uh, mm -hmm. again, um, I think one of the many things that is so difficult about trying to even come with a simple, the simplest model about either propagation or any case of effects of the pandemic uh, behavior of this thing mm -hmm. is precisely yep. because we can't really control the way people react to instructions. Like if you say, let's use masks, somebody will come up with some reason, with some social reason, probably yes. far away from reason, from scientific facts that says, don't use masks, just go to the ocean, take, dive, deep, dive deep in the sea, and you <laughs> will just get cured. And, and a lot of people <laughs> will go after that because it's fun, it's easy, for some yeah. people living by the coast, but you know, it's not going to work, but it's just social behavior is, it's really hard to control. And, and I think, you know, I agree you know, with Jack about that because it's a very hard thing dearly. to control. <laughs> and I think, right? uh, Q, Q man, you, you kind of have a similar perspective, right? Because that's the difficulty when you're trying to model, uh, of biological systems or human behavior, because right, you, you right. don't really yeah, have control. Yeah, that is very difficult. Yeah. 
But social scientists keep on trying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it, they do continue to try. <laughs> it's yeah. It's, it's just funny the way we people react to instructions. You know, it's yeah. like uh, we somehow think that. I mean, there is this uh, this attitude that you tend to just not trust. Uh, yeah what is in the public media, you know, and, and you right, don't, right. Uh, most people are like, you okay, gave everybody says I need to wear a mask, I wear a mask or something like that. And, and, and people get suspicious yeah. that somebody's trying to control them. And then eventually they're going to, they're going to put a ship in them and yeah. something like that. And people start, you know, with crazy, weird theories. And you know, that but, reminds me of, you know, a lot of the, you know, recent uh, Nobel prize in uh, winners in economic science. You know, they, they oh. are pretty much all statisticians, you know, modeling the human behavior that is motivated by, you know, profits and all that. Now, why aren't we thinking about something like that in the uh, health behavior as well? I mean, there are some studies, you know, there was a, you know, a, a program, even, uh, uh, you know, smartphone apps where people, you know, participate because they have monetary sort of gains you know, by behaving in a certain way. I are we not? So, I mean, one dramatic way is put a, I mean, I joked the other day actually with, uh, you know, uh, with a close friend. You know, somebody refused to take a, a, a mask, okay? And suppose that person happens to infect the other person can we try that person as an intentional homicide or if that person get infected and dies? I'm sure there's a, you know, attorney general somewhere who is looking for an opportunity to make a case. <laughs> Indict that person for intentional homicide. I bet, yeah. Do we have to take measures like that to change behavior? <laughs> or like the economists yeah, that... would like to do, do we use the monetary right. you know, penalties to change behavior? Yeah, Another just, example that I always use, you know, in uh, 2005, around that time, there was an uncontrolled propagation of the measles incidents in the uh, Midwest United States. And it took an entire year for epidemiologists at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention figured out it was because a single young woman from Iowa oh. whose parents opted her out of getting vaccinated when she was an infant. Wow. And this young woman went on a missionary a volunteer work in Romania, visiting orphanages, contracted measles, and she was spreading measles all over Midwest in an airplane. Oh, no. Wow. No, that's a fascinating article. I, if you're interested, I'll export it to you. Please, I, yeah. I started to ask the question, should we put the parents with a legal liability? Nations spend hundreds of millions of dollars to control that. Do we use the measures like that? Put that behavior, anti-vaxxers, with a potential liability they cannot handle. Some, I'm sure there's a, some, you know, policy people are thinking about that. Yeah. Because well, that's the thing. I, mean, I remember uh, as someone who raised three children, you know, taking them to, you know, vaccination when they were infants, <laughs> reading through the fine letters, you know, oh, there's a, you know, one in a million chance of, you know, severe, at least in the United States, there's a fund to cover for events like that. There's a fund prepared to compensate for untoward events like that because it happens. But some people make a decision to opt their children out of that. 20 some years ago, they never imagined that their daughter will grow up and go and visit the uh, Romanian orphanage and contact visas are spread all over Midwest. Oh. And so just around that time, a dentist from the middle class 
at a wedding ceremony in Greece. And when he discovered that he had a multi-drug resistant TB, he intentionally traveled through Canada and crossed the border into the United States. It was a criminal behavior because he as a medical person knew what he has. If he goes through the regular uh, uh, port of entry, he will be quarantined. Mm -hmm. I see. He took the action of sneaking through Canada, Canadian border, and eventually he was caught, put him in a, a sanatorium in, uh, uh, in a Colorado, but it created a scare all throughout the United States. I see. So do we hold that person criminally accountable or even financially accountable? Because it cost the taxpayer an awful lot of money. I see. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's... So I would like, you know, the society to think about, you know, just like the economists, you know, they, they always think about personal behavior based on the, you know, financial gains and all that. Why don't we use that, introduce that into the uh, social policy? If they know that there's a remote possibility, but if you get it, you'll be ruined by your action. <laughs> <laughs> I see your point. Yeah. Yeah, well, the reaction from that the reactions now for the loss functions, right? But that's what economists to do anyway, right? Right, yeah, at the societal level. Yeah, actually, I, I before I go on, I, I, I have a, a an awful scene to confess, you know, it's like <laughs> I am quite an outsider, so I'm not a statistician or, uh, or anything like that but I am strongly interested in, 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 in modeling and stuff like uh -huh. that. Okay. And, yeah. and I honestly found very interesting this, these kinds of stuff you do and, and the kinds of uh, covariance matrices you do because that kind of falls into my uh, uh, research interests with, uh, regard the, uh, regarding applications of matrix theory and stuff oh, like okay. that. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so actually I would like to know if, if at some point, I don't know Milena or, or Cuman, are, you, are we going to go, are we, are we going to go to be able to get some uh, copies of your presentation and maybe oh, some sure. references? Yeah, yeah. No, I already sent it to uh, uh, Milena. And also be great. I have more detailed description of this review paper. Uh, ah, nice. Uh, Milena already has it. So yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And and the other thing is you can share so, it. I will I will <clears throat> I will upload it in a in a web page and I will share it to everyone. And if you want the, the slides straight away, I can I can um that would the be journal great. article send I sent to you, mm -hmm. it's it's an open source journal, so you can distribute it without any problem. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, this this kind of this sort of structure you you can find in these covariance matrices mm -hmm. that replicate outside uh, this specific field of uh, clinical insights or so the do you know any cases yeah. where this replicates? No, these things are used all the time in longitudinal analysis. People use uh, you know autoregressive model. People use uh, right. you know. Yeah, and and what we did in our case is to just estimate the uh, variance based on the, the data that we have using the uh, Pearson uh, residual. Nice. And what we discovered is that when we use that to estimate the unknown variance structure, it worked really well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because my, my question, Cuman, is because uh, in my field in, in system identification, I'm very interested in parametric uh, uh, yeah, identification. Yeah, yeah. So, and I find very interesting these kinds of estimates you do in the, in the way you look for estimation for these parameters. Right. So I would like yeah. to see like the process, you know, behind it, because uh, some of the techniques I am, I am uh, applying right now, uh, in a sense, fortunately, most of the funding I'm getting for research right now comes from industry. So oh, I don't okay. quite yeah. have to deal like with, like with uh, you know, uh, lives and, and, and difficult decisions that, in, that involve these kinds of delicate procedures about the ethics and, mm -hmm. and things with medical conditions. But still, I mean, I, I try to take advantage of these nice advanced techniques you guys use to estimate parameters and these uh, problems you have. And sometimes they, they, they kind of work for me as well in the kinds of models I am out Oh, of course, yeah. And at the same time, I uh, actually, I, I talked to Milena in, in previous communication, probably by mail, <clears throat> right, Milena? Because we, we didn't quite uh, talk, but by mail, 
uh, precisely because of this. I am interested in trying to extrapolate and maybe with Milena, Jack and some other people here in, in okay. the Central American region, try to come up with some models that kind of work in our reality, you know, because as Jack was saying, and, and I can relate to that, it's really difficult to come up with a rigorous mathematical model yeah. of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of something like COVID, which is not just biological, it's, it's strongly yeah. social, you know, because, right, right, right. because people, get, know, people know, get scared uh, and, and when people get scared, people act weird, you know, yeah. <laughs> because, because, because have, of that. Have you heard of uh, George uh, Box? <laughs> Doesn't ring a bell, no. Yeah, he's a statistician. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a founder of the statistics program on my campus. Okay. Uh, okay. He is famous for having said the following. All models are wrong. <laughs> Some are useful. I, I love those kinds of phrases. I, I, I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you believe that the model is true, why do you need a study? <laughs> right. It's like saying, oh, I'm God. <laughs> I know right. everything. <laughs> My point is, Cuman, and I, and I don't know if this is the sort of your point of view as well. It's like, it's not a, a, from my perspective, it's not a good yeah. question to say, is this the model, you know, like, like right, the model right, yeah. that, that does it? Mm -hmm. Instead, why can't we just go and say, okay, why if we try to combine this model and this model? And this model and pull them together and try to come up with an algorithm sure yeah, wait it yeah. out yeah. and say on the right and also you have to you have to test whether that data born out the model that's right. the key component you have to be able to test it <laughs> at the exactly, end exactly exactly I, I will i will say well my my uh, contribution to it is that first and this is why I wanted actually to start with clinical trials and to um, discuss which are the pieces of evidence that we need at first. And uh, previously, well, with um, Jack's question, I actually said that it, you, you also have to think in, in different levels of, of evidence. And uh, well, for for a country like United States, for example, or the UK, or even uh, Germany, or or countries like that, maybe even China or something like that, they have a machines of <clears throat> research machines. I will say, I mean, they. I think the United States have um, even there is a lot of funding directed to it. However, in, in, in Central America, I will say, or, or I, I will just go um, on the Costa Rican example. Uh, and I think we are just starting to, to pay attention that we have to do start, or we have to start doing uh, clinical research. And yeah. so mm -hmm. it has, like, for me, it has, um, like two, two, two roots or, or two different, or that can be parallel, but you, you don't have to miss out the observational uh, issues. And so firstly, my, uh, what the, maybe what, what I was proposing here in Costa Rica was to undertake um, something that I would, I would like to call like um, a 360 map or uh, to undertake a new diagnostic of the epidemiological photography, I will say, like... Uh, yeah, you, 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 know, you bring up a very good point. I mean, before you'll be able to do experiment, you really have to understand the landscape of the uh, uh, conditions that affects the uh, you know, population the most, you know? And that's how I look at even the evolution of statistical methods. You know, in the uh, uh, early uh, 20th century, the, most of the countries were concerned about how to feed their population. That's why a lot of investment happened in the UK in the experimental design. And they got out. And United States in the 40s and 50s, they imported a lot of the statisticians from UK and they became the uh, leading force in educating future generation of statisticians. And then, you had, and then the statistical sort of development happened in the industrial application with the quality controls and manufacturing thing. 
So if you think about in the 70s and 80s, most of the statisticians educated in the United States went into industry. But now, I mean, if you look at UK, United States, and some of the you know, rich countries, we became a post-industrialized service-oriented economy, like banking, healthcare. That's when the statisticians go into you know, health application, you know, financial industry. And I think it is just a natural way how the society is addressing their need and the professions follow in a way to address Kima, that need. But Kima, you have a point that is very important in my interests of research, that is innovation. As far as health keeps going up in evolving in, in the industries, in different industries, right. inno innovation is gonna keep all the other industries to go forward that's for yeah, sure yeah that's for sure but uh, yeah i mean you know, one mm -hmm. one area that i always think about because i'm interested in uh, uh clinical trials with the AIDS epidemic and all that you know the u.s government investing particularly the uh, george uh the, the the second bush you know i never had any respect for him for what he did in the midwest but he's parting act as the president that really impressed me was this PEPFAR, President Emergency Fund for AIDS. He allocated to not just in the United States, all over the world. And with the AIDS epidemic and clinical trials happening in the US and with the NIH funding trials being done in Central, South America, you know, uh, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, the whole world has learned about the importance of uh, uh, clinical trials. I remember uh, at the end of one of the large clinical trials, the trial unblinding took place in uh, Buenos Aires because they had one of the coordinating centers along with the uh, uh, Amsterdam, UK and the United States. So people came together. And so US are obviously doing a lot of clinical trial, not just the industry sponsored, but also NIH funded clinical trials. And this has uh, uh, some impact in other countries as well. You know? So not every country has the uh, financial means to support clinical trial, but just to give you an example, I mean, you know, uh, I'm supposed to be, have gone to Belgium because the uh, University of Ghent statistical team decided to uh, have a clinical trial conference for the first time in their history. Because even in countries like Belgium, they have industries, but they don't have the clinical trial that is done by the uh, university doctors. So they didn't have any need. People will get trained and go to work for industry. You know, Belgium has some global companies like UCBs and all that, but not at the academic level because they were just conducting trials the industry brings. They never done a clinical trial where their own investigators are addressing the issues that industry would not address. So that's why all over the world, I mean, the local area has their own disease or health conditions that they have to address that pharmaceutical company would not pay attention to because the market is small. Because as we know, their operation is, the modus operandi is to make money. If the, if the patient population is, you know, if there may be a patient population, but the country is poor, cannot afford to pay for it, they're not gonna do a study there. So it's the local doctors has to address that question, but then that requires government investment, right? right. Well, that's that's the key thing. For example, with the <clears throat> the um, COVID test, for example, or the the fast uh, test that they they are trying to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, the first thing, for example, when was that one was that whether it was uh, an observational. Uh, study or if it was a, a, a clinical trial where where this is something that is going to make a change and then the test is sometimes right, yeah. based, very invasive it's like not necessarily it's just so these are the the 
for example, issues that have been happening in Costa Rica that mark mm -hmm. yeah. how difficult it's been uh, for either side, even the government, in order to approve clinical trials. Right. There are yeah. some mm -hmm. people investing. However, uh, researchers don't actually have uh, the, the, the resources uh, right. in terms of yeah. how mm -hmm. actually they evaluate <clears throat> this. They think that it's just a matter of, of doing a, a difference between uh, one or the other. And the problem here is that there isn't even an estimation of the prevalence, for example, for COVID. And I will add that the prevalence for either, or all of the other um, characteristics or conditions that we could observe could have changed because of the of these new aspects that are in right yes yes in the, in the environment and that we don't know so if we start undertaking or investing a lot of money uh undertaking clinical trials that we don't really know uh, because we don't know if those uh trials are uh, tending specific needs of the state right or of, of where is I mean, before before a clinical trial, you have to have a, you know, you know, public health of surveillance system to to have a pulse of the health of the nation, right? You know, various you know infectious disease, you know. Oh. How can you even think of starting a study when they do not know the extent of the you know, uh, uh, the disease. I will actually, I want to, to, to portray this because I want to make um, a parallel with your talk, especially with sequential methods. I will, I will see mm -hmm. this process as, uh, as Fred is asking and, and, and Jack also, and I'm sure all of the others have the same questions. Like how do, do we raise these uh, projects in countries like uh, Costa Rica, Honduras, that um, so it's a, a, this is the monitoring that we should undertake. So okay, we right. have these prevalences. We don't know anything about this, so we should undertake more uh, research on this part. And then uh, the, I will say parallel on that. As long as the, the information is it's coming, then we can undertake uh, more complex or more uh, expensive trials. And then mm -hmm. after some a serious observations, then mathematicians and, and physicians and, and physicists and everybody and statisticians will uh, start ringing the bell because they right. might start achieving uh, parts of the model. I will not say the whole thing, but at least to approach different and right. then yeah. start informing uh decision making in a more different way but i will start by the 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 more simple things as estimating a prevalence as right. knowing mm -hmm. the incidences as knowing how for example i will say how uh, and, and and human pointed at this very very in a very accurate way is that the differences between each country because uh, Costa Rica, for example, has a very a strong um, clinical and security system. It's like the clinical tension. It's like a lot of, and we, Jack and I, we were discussing this a, a bit of uh, earlier. And I, my my point here was that a lot of people come from outside to receive a clinical attention. In okay. Yeah. Okay. So because yeah. of 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 this, this was something that was actually discuss in the, in the Ministry of Health at some point that the strengthening of the system in Costa Rica was also a Central American uh, or could be a, a Central American strategy because not necessarily Panama or even Nicaragua doesn't have the same structure. So right. yeah. if they will say Nicaraguans will say okay let's stay at home or whatever they didn't actually have the means uh, of to do it for example in Mexico yeah. it's like tell everybody to go home it's like come on come on they they have the most dense country in the world even when you tell them stop going out I mean they are already a lot of people in their own homes 
So yeah. it, it doesn't make sense to do some 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 sort of thing. So I will say like uh, to think also in a sequential way and a, a process of a long distance uh, results, not, not, not necessarily to have everything uh, which I think is the illusion of the vaccine this year, which uh, it's, it's, this is something for me very interesting because to see where everybody is asking, oh, but okay, let's wait the vaccine. But I would say, well, but when are we going to know where this vaccine is actually effective? It's like, oh, we will have no, to no, wait. Pre preliminary <laughs> data is very strong. <laughs> So yeah, but yeah. then, then on the other hand, it's like uh, I think uh, in Europe they they actually said said it uh, more accurate. But in here in Costa Rica, at least that they started to say that they were going to va to vaccinate everybody. But at some places, I I can recall that um, what they said was a, a voluntary call. Is that if you wanted to go and take the vaccine, then you you could go. But they they actually said that it was a voluntary thing. Here in Costa Rica, it's, oh, like, okay. it's been sold more kind of as a necessity or as a as a key thing. But then, well, some people who have been calling me and asking me things is like, what what do you think? Or so what who who should be vaccinated first? Or, or this or that. And I was like, I mean, it's very, 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 uh, we we should, I, 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 how I see it is that we should go step by step, like uh, not necessarily go and, and get adventures and the first technology we see across. So just to think about it and start getting to know ourselves first and then steer research in that direction. I would say that. Well, I mean, uh, as you know, COVID-19 is being an infectious spiral, you know, pathogenic disease. I mean, like people have developed this vaccine. So, I mean, th th there was, you know, I never doubted that if it becomes available and if my you know, numbers call up, I'll get vaccinated. And I got vaccinated in February because the university said, oh, you're a certain age, you are now can make an appointment. So I got the uh, email message from the central campus uh, early afternoon, six o'clock in the evening, I got vaccinated. So now they are sort of expanding that and uh, uh, you know, people who has to go to work for lab work, they got vaccinated, regardless of their age. So there, but the thing is different, you know, even in the United States, different town has a different uh, priority. <laughs> different state has a different priority. It's crazy. I don't know why they cannot come up with a, you know, uh, some consistency. I mean, I guess yeah. this goes back to what we were what, what we were discussing at the very beginning about yeah. the social behavior is so unpredictable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the bigger the country, the, the larger the population, the harder is yeah, the harder it is. Yeah. Something yeah. To, yeah. that works yeah. for everybody. Yeah. I guess. Although see, there are yeah. there are small countries where that is real hard as well. So <laughs> whatever there is more than one people, probably it's gonna be hard to make a decision, you know, because if you have two people who don't want to agree on something, they are going to discuss and not going to be That's able right. to, I mean, to come up. Uh, as someone who enjoys uh, reading historical novels, I believe that every big empire is gonna fail because <laughs> it becomes too big to manage. <laughs> I see your point, yeah. Every yeah, big empire behind. eventually failed. <laughs> Speaking of empires, what is the temple behind you in the, in the, in the back? I, I, right. I you were oh, happy, th you had that, to say something. Yeah, that was, I couldn't uh, help noticing it as well. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, a place called Pious Tomb, uh, south of uh, uh, Naples. It's oh, one of the Ro oh. Roman uh, was actually uh, ruins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. I thought it was like a like a Greek thing. I thought. Yeah, I, looked, I, yeah. I said the exact 
Oh, no, you're right. Actually, it's a Greek a Greek temple. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah you're right. It's okay. a, a, actually a Greek temple. Yeah. When oh. large part of Italy used to be Greek colony. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Then the Romans too. So it is in Italy, but it has a like Greek origin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, okay. Greece, I mean, Spain, and all these parts used to be, you know, Phoenician colony and Greek colonies and all of that. <laughs> right, right. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So anyway, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Can you, can, oh, I'm glad to hear that. It was, yeah. it was, <laughs> it was it was very nice. I, uh, and and again, if I can get the slides, that will that will be great. Yeah. And mm -hmm. maybe some of the references that will be great as well. Yeah. Um, I am I am so, seriously I mean, interested. If yeah. uh, uh, Melina uh, Galena makes the uh, uh, slide set and the publication that I sent to her, uh, you will have all the things that you will need. Yeah. Yeah, I will prepare that awesome. and I'll send it uh, as soon as I can. So I'll promise, I'll promise to do that. And then now, um, uh, well, for, for you, I actually wanted to invite you, Freddy and, and Leonidas as well. And well, any of the ones that are still in, in, in the forum, if uh, anyone wants to provide a talk on, on their own research or they want to um, get their own perspective on all of these uh, subjects that we are addressing, just just send me a, an email or, or or a quick test or a text or always or something like that and i will arrange it i will uh start um um by sharing all of the materials from from this talk i will be sharing all of all their um resources in order that we can uh add more information if you want to share some other articles that you are writing or working on or questions that you want to bring us here or want to invite someone also uh let's just uh this is the space for you and and for um this to to go deeper in these discussions i think awesome. and also milena or others i mean if there's a specific topic that you'd like to sort of have featured in this talk i mean let me know you know i can talk to people with certain expertise to you know give a talk Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, because I think we can have like um, these sessions like uh, at least twice a, a month or something like that. Oh, okay. Every yeah. Fifteen days, and uh, if if um, we can have like the other session, if you want to join for other discussions or more uh, workshop discussions or other uh, aspects of of the talk, like. I will say that every Tuesday I'm going to be here for any of the discussions that you want to put in the agenda. So um, mm -hmm. let's, I'm very, very happy for all of this actually. And I am very, very grateful to all of you because um, this space means, I think a lot of uh, starts in this uh, new perspectives, not only for Latin America, I think it's, uh, a global thing that we can actually uh, contribute to. So this is Indeed, uh, yeah. a way of saying thank you.